So today's lesson is just going to be more quadratics recap. We're going to go over like a good selection of questions, especially chapter four style questions that will help us prepare for our upcoming quadratics exam. Uh, we're also really going to go over the discriminant today. I'll show you that in the uh, today's plan thing here. We're really going to go over that concept of the discriminant again today because it's easy to forget about it. Um, but then after I do that, then that's when we'll go into a bunch of questions. It'll be kind of one of those uh, drill and skill kind of days where I show you a question. I'll get you to try it on your own and then we'll go over it together. Um, but we'll see. Let's get going. So first things first, the discriminant. I want you to recall that the portion underneath the square root in the quadratic formula, so if you were to look at the quadratic formula on your formula sheet, for example, uh, is known as the discriminant. So the discriminant is equal to b squared minus 4ac. The whole point of the discriminant, like the whole reason that this thing even exists, is it tells you the nature of the roots, which is just a fancy way of saying how many roots there are. If you have a positive discriminant, you're going to have two roots. So that means you'll have two different x-intercepts. If you have a negative discriminant, you're going to have no roots. And then if your discriminant is just equal to zero, you'll actually have one root. And the reason for this is because in the uh, quadratic formula, the discriminant is like underneath the square root sign. So like the square root of b squared minus 4ac. Remember, if you square root a positive number, like on this first case, if you square root a positive number like positive 9, you're going to get 3 or negative 3. So you're going to have two different roots. If you try to square root a negative number, however, like negative 9, there is no square root, right? There is no square root of a negative number. You can't do it, right? However, if you square root 0, <coughs> excuse me, if you square root 0, square root of 0 is just 0. There's no positive 0 or a negative 0. It's just 0, right? So there's only one root. Anyway, hopefully that makes some sense. So anytime you see like, oh, state the nature of the roots, that's just a fancy way of saying use the discriminant. Tell me how many roots there are, right? Anyway, here we go. Speaking of which, determine the nature of the roots of the following. I'm actually going to give you a moment to pause the video here, try both of these questions, and then I'll go over it in just a second. All right, I'll go over this now. So to find the nature of the roots, we need to find the discriminant b squared minus 4ac. I'll just write it there so I have it for these other questions. b squared in this first question is going to be 8 squared minus 4 times a, which is negative 2, times c, which is negative 4. That's right, you have to use your, your negatives that you see on there. Those aren't just there for show. Uh, if we evaluate this, I'll do my exponent first. So that'll be 64. Uh, I might as well tackle all this as well. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Negative 8 times negative 4 is 32. So that's minus positive 32. Well, 64 minus positive 32 equals positive 32. So that's our discriminant right there. And because that's a positive number, I can tell you right now, this is going to have two roots, right? The number doesn't have to square root nice, right? Like the square root of 32 would be a horrible thing. It'd be five point something, but it's still positive. So we're going to have two roots, right? As for this next one, uh, b squared, that'll be negative six squared. Notice I put negative six in brackets. That's important. Minus four times a, so four times five uh, times c, which is two. Cleaning this up, negative six squared. That's negative six times negative six. That's going to be positive 36 minus 4 times 5, which is 20. 20 times 2 is 40, so 36 minus 40. 36 minus 40 is going to equal negative 4. That's our discriminant. Since that's a negative number, how many roots will we have? Well, we'll have zero roots, right? And the reason for that is, even though 4 is a perfect square, if you try square rooting negative 4, you're just not going to get an answer at all. Anyway, next one, a graphing question. I'm going to get you guys to give this one a try as well, so pause the video here. Give it a shot. So to draw the graph of the function, the first thing we always should do is find the vertex. This function that I gave you is in standard form. When you have a standard form function to find the vertex, you have to use this little equation that says x equals negative b over 2a. And unfortunately, that's not on our formula sheet. I mean, it kind of is. It's part of the quadratic formula, just if you ignore the whole square root nonsense. But uh, it is what it is. Anyway, so vertex negative b over 2a. So x equals negative negative 6, that'd be positive 6, over 2 times a, 2 times, I guess that'd be 1 is our a value there, so 2 times 1. 6 divided by 2 times 1 is just 3. That means our vertex is 3 something. We've got to find what that something is. So to find that something, just take 3 and plug it into your equation. That's going to be 3 squared. Notice I'm replacing x with 3, so 3 squared minus 6 times 3. So again, I'm replacing x with a 3. Uh, and then plus 3, that's just a coincidence that that was a 3 there. It's just is what it is. Anyway, throw that in. Uh, you're going to see 3 squared is 9. 
minus 6 times 3 is 18, plus 3. 9 minus 18 is negative 9. Negative 9 plus 3 equals negative 6. So my vertex is going to be 3, negative 6. <laughs> so if I plot this on my graph, 3, negative 6 looks like it's about right here. There we go. So what we need to do from there is we need to do something that I call the 1, 4, 9 rule. How the 1, 4, 9 rule works is you start at your vertex, and then you go over one point, and then up 1 times A. Well, A in this case is 1. So if I'm going over 1 and then up 1 times 1, well, that means I'm only going up one point. For the 4 part of the 1, for 9 rule, go back to your vertex, go over two points, and then up 4 times A. Well, 4 times 1 is 4. So if I went over two points, I have to go up 4 times 1. So 4 points, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's going to be my next spot. 9 part of the 1, for 9 rule. You might uh, be able to guess this one. Go back to your vertex, go over three points, and then up nine times A. So nine times one is going to be up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, if you're really, really, really bold, the one four nine rule can actually be extended to a one four nine sixteen rule. We're almost actually at that point here because I think you can see that if I went over four points, I'd have to go up sixteen dots. Well, sixteen above negative six would take us up to negative ten, which would be just off the charts here. I'm not going to worry about the 16 part of the 149 rule. You don't ever have to worry about it either. Anyway, so our 149 is done. Notice how we have like an arm kind of coming up here. The last thing you got to do with the 149 rule is just make it symmetrical. So this dot that went over here, there'll be a twin dot over here. There'll be another twin dot for this one over here. And then another twin dot for this one over here. And now once I twinned those dots, you can very clearly see where our quadratic is. It forms a nice parabola shape. Parabola is just a fancy word for like a U shape, right? Anyway, try to connect these with a dot. It's kind of, I'm sorry, with a curve. Um, it's kind of hard to do this with this uh, pen that I'm using, but I always try my best. Yeah, good enough. Put arrows on the end of it because it goes on forever, right? Uh, here we go. Lift the pen. There we go. This is really tough on this uh, pen tablet thing. Anyway, there you go. Putting arrows in the end, that lets us know it goes on forever. A little bit scratchy, but you get the idea. On actual pen and paper, it's a little bit easier, but... Uh, it is what it is. So again, to draw the graph, start with your vertex, plot that, and then do the 149 rule on it. And if you need review on the 149 rule, just watch that section over again. No big deal. All right, next one. Find the roots of the following quadratic algebraically. That means, uh oh, you can't use your graphing calculator. You have to figure this out by hand. Um, I'll give you a hint. You have total freedom on which method to use here, other than you can't use your graphing calculator. Uh, you have total freedom here, so you can use either factoring, vertex form, or the quadratic formula. But there is one that I think is the best here. But you have total freedom. You can use whatever you want. Pause the video here. Give it a try. All right. So I'm going to go over this one. There's a, a best method. And then there's a second best method. And then there's a third best method for this one. I'd say the best method, in my humble opinion, would be to factor this. <laughs> Excuse me. The reason I say the best method would be to factor is because this is just a standard sum product rule question. Because we have an A value of 1, which means negative 9 represents our sum and negative 22 represents our product. And spoiler alert, there is a pretty easy pair of numbers that add to be negative nine, but multiply to be negative 22. We'll get to that in a second. The second best option would be the quadratic formula because it works every single time on a standard form quadratic. If you use the quadratic formula on this one, good for you, honestly, that works. It just takes a little bit more time, that's all. Uh, the third best method, or in other words, the worst method for this one, would be to use the vertex form method because this is not in vertex form. I know in the past I've given you some questions where it's like, oh, use the vertex form method on it, and it's a standard form. That's just me being a jerk, right? Like there'd be no practical reason of doing that. Why would you ever change to vertex form just to use a vertex form method? There's other ways of doing it. Anyway, I'll stop rambling. I'm going to use my preferred method here, the sum product rule. Two numbers that have a sum of negative 9, but a product of negative 22. If you think about that for two seconds, we can say that the first number would be negative 11. And the second number, so I call them P and Q, by the way, the second number would be positive 2. Because negative 11 plus 2 is negative 9, but negative 11 times 2 is negative 22. Now, what do we do with these two numbers? Well, because it's just the normal sum product rule, not the adapted one, that's where we have an A value that's not 1. Because it's the normal sum product rule, we can actually just jump straight to our factored form. So this in factored form, just use your P and your Q, would be X minus 11 times X plus 2. That's it, right? So that is now fully factored. 
Now the question wants us to find the roots of this, however, that means the x-intercepts, that's just where you set this equal to zero and find where this thing would be zero, right? Because it's factored, this is only going to be zero if either this piece is equal to zero, because if x minus 11 was zero, you'd have zero times whatever this is, which is zero. Or if this piece equals zero, because you'd have zero times whatever x minus 11 is, right? Well, if x minus 11 equals zero, you can easily solve this by adding 11 on both sides. You can see that x would equal 11. That right there, x equals 11, is one of our x-intercepts. As for this other one, you'd see x plus 2 equals 0. We'll just minus 2 on both sides, and you'll see that x equals negative 2. That would be your other x-intercept. Those two things I just boxed there, those are your two x-intercepts. We're all done, right? If you use the quadratic formula, you would have found the exact same answers, assuming you plugged in the numbers correctly. Uh, the only issue is it would have taken you longer. At least I pretty much can bet it would have taken you longer. But it is what it is. There's nothing wrong with using the quadratic formula on this one. You were given total freedom. Even if you use the vertex form method on this one, nothing really wrong with it. It would have taken you like a page of work, but it is what it is. Anyway, let's go on. Another question. Find the roots of this one algebraically. So once again, you have total freedom. Pause the video here. Give it a shot. So this question, um, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Uh, this is one of the very rare questions in which I don't know why on earth you'd use anything other than the vertex form method, because this is already in vertex form. You can't use the quadratic formula on this directly. If you were going to, you'd have to expand it out. You'd have to go like 2 times x plus 7 times x plus 7. It would take forever, right? So instead, I'm just going to find the roots using the vertex form method. <coughs> this just says, set this thing equal to 0. So once it's set equal to 0, just get the squared piece all by itself, right? So to get the squared piece by itself, let's add 200 on both sides. This gives me 2 times x plus 7 squared equals 200. Then once we have this, let's just divide by 2 because I want to get the squared all by itself. So if we divide by 2 on both sides, we have x plus 7 squared equals 200 divided by 2, which is, of course, just 100. And then we can just square root both sides. If we square root x plus 7 squared, we just get x plus 7. But if we square root 100, the square root of 100 is exactly 10. However, you have to realize in quadratics, when you square root just a standard old number, there could be a positive answer or there could be a negative answer. So this could also be x plus 7 equals negative 10. A lot of this has to do with the fact that with quadratics, typically you're going to have two different arms of the quadratic that you'll have to solve. Another reason for this, just a more rational reason, is if you ask yourself what times itself equals 100, well, 10 times itself equals 100, because 10 times 10 is 100, but negative 10 times itself is also equal to 100. So negative 10 times negative 10 equals 100. Anyway, you just have to remember two answers, right? So when you square root 100, it's positive 10 or it's negative 10. Solve each of these, minus 7 on both sides. We have x equals 10 minus 7 is 3. So x equals 3 is one of our answers. On this one, once again, minus 7 on both sides. We have x equals negative 17. That is a negative sign right there, right? So x equals negative 17. If you had solved this some other way, kudos to you, honestly. I don't know why you'd use factoring, because factoring, you'd have to multiply this through, and then you haven't adapted some product rule. It'd be a mess. But if you use the quadratic formula, it would have also just been a lot of work. But it is what it is. Anyway, here's a word problem. Uh, a ball is thrown up into the air. The height of the ball, which is h of t in meters, is a function of time t in seconds is given by this. So in other words, this variable here is going to be your height of the ball. And then the t, oh, there's an x in here. That should be a t, my mistake. Uh, the t that's in here should be uh, your time in seconds. So question A, find the maximum height of the ball. And B, after how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? Pause the video here, try both of those questions, and I'll go over it in just a second. All right, so I'm going to go over this one now. I'm going to be blunt with you. Uh, this question mentions absolutely nothing about solving this algebraically. Right? It doesn't say, oh, you have to find the maximum height algebraically or whatever. Uh, that tells me I can use my graphing calculator as much as I want. So if I plug this in my graphing calculator, uh, I want to see whether it's going to give me a nice uh, solid graph. Right. So if I plug this in my graphing calculator, instead of T, you have to put X because your graphing calculator doesn't have a T button. But if you punch this in your graphing calculator and you uh, press graph with just a standard window, it actually gives you a really awesome graph of this. Just kind of give you a sketch of what it looks like on my screen. It looks something, something like this, just on my normal standard window, right? Not exactly the best drawing going, but it does, it does look something like that, right? The maximum height of the ball, remember this is time and this is height. The maximum height of the ball is going to be your vertex. 
right there, right? So if we're finding that vertex, the maximum height would just be the Y component, because this is X down here and this is Y, it would just be the Y component of whatever your vertex is. You can solve for this algebraically using X equals negative B over 2A and then plugging whatever the answer is into this, or you can just straight up using uh, straight up use your graphing calculator. If you're gonna use your graphing calculator, you have to press second and then trace. And since we're looking for a maximum, select the button that says maximum, right? Upon doing so, it's gonna ask you for a left bound and a right bound. What that just means is basically move your cursor using your arrow keys to the left of your maximum and then to your right of your maximum. And then it asks you for a guess. So then you just guess what your maximum is and it gives it to you as a coordinate. In my graphing calculator, the coordinate gave me to the nearest hundredth is 1.12 and then 6.06. You need to recognize that because what went into this function was time, this 1.12 is your time, and this 6.06 .06 is your height. So the maximum height of the ball would actually be 6.06, .06, and the units of height is meters. So 6.06 .06 meters. Your graphing calculator is an extremely powerful resource for this. You didn't actually have to touch like any math equations for this. You just basically had to throw it in your graphing calculator and use it as a tool to find the rest. If you wanted to solve for it algebraically, you're more than welcome to do so, but I don't really see a purpose in doing so here. Uh, the next part of the question, after how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? This is where your graphing calculator really shines. Uh, your graphing calculator shows you the path of the ball as it goes through the air, right? So it goes up, 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 and then it comes down, down, down. Well, hitting the ground basically just means you have a height that's equal to zero, right? Anything here that's below the x-axis is technically the ball going underground, which in reality doesn't really make any sense. So if we're looking for after how many seconds the ball hits the ground, we're looking for the time right at the x-intercept right there. So the time at this x-intercept on the right is going to be the, the time that the ball hits the ground. Once again, I would just use our graphing calculator for this. Uh, in your graphing calculator, they call an x-intercept a zero. So again, a zero is the same thing as an x-intercept in your calculator. Uh, so if you press second and then trace and then select zero, it asks you for, again, a left bound and a right bound. I'm just going to change color here so you can see this a little bit better. Uh, if you're finding a left bound and a right bound around this x-intercept, your left bound, using your arrow keys, is going to be to the left of this, which will be over here. Your right bound will be to the right of this, which is over here. I'll just call that RB and LB, left bound and right bound. And then your guess just means get as close to it as you possibly can. So if I get my left bound and my right bound in here, I'm just plugging this in right now, it's going to give me the coordinate 2.360. So in other words, that's your time and that's your height. Of course, we have a height of zero because it hit the ground. So the time is going to equal 2.36 seconds, right? That would be the time at which the ball hits the ground. Really, in all honesty, these word problem kind of questions, if you can get a graph of it, it provides a much better visual of what's going on. These can be a little bit overwhelming uh, at first, but with some practice, it hopefully makes a little bit more sense. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's it for today. Uh, so for practice, the chapter four assignment booklet, if you're not done yet, please make sure that gets done. It's due uh, on Thursday, if you're watching this in 2022. Uh, for extra practice, there's some textbook questions there. But additionally, I also have a quadratics review booklet that I'll have handed out for you. Uh, it's just a really good sample selection of questions, and the answers are located at the back of it. I'm not taking that one in for marks. Only the Chapter 4 assignment is being taken in for marks, so make sure you get that one done first before anything else. Anyway, if you have any questions, please reach out, uh, whether it's to me or whether it's to your peers, and best of luck.